One, two, three. Hello and welcome back to the Mixing Music Podcast. I'm your host, DK, and with me, as always, my wonderful, glorious, amazing co-host, Lead them On Lou. Just lead them on. See, I like the chase more than the catch. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible <laughs> that's terrible please anna don't kill me my fiance oh my goodness but, uh, that's so funny um yeah that's a horrible nickname i don't even know why that was i mean that, that's like that was the most random thing ever i mean we could we could have said ludovica lou ludo ludovica mm-hmm. ludovica is one of my artists yeah but it starts with the lou yeah or i was just trying it's to think my of, it's like, my double personality on the weekends you're, you're i'm ludo. ludovica you're Ludovica. That's ter- yeah. that's that's amazing. Um, but yeah, today <laughs> today's episode, um, we're gonna talk. This is gonna be more of an explainer episode, and I want this to kind of be like YouTube video style. Uh, this is gonna be more just explaining how things work um, because I know there's a lot of confusion. So we're gonna talk about the history and the present and potentially even the future of how the music process works, from ideation to completed marketed product. Right. So. There's, we're going to break it up into three sections and as we explain this. Um, and the purpose of this explanation is to help you understand what part of the process you might be in or what part of the processes you might need to go through. Or spe- what you need help in. And what you need help in. And, and both the standard of industry standard at a commercial level, high rate level, and then uh, as well as, you know, at, at a non-smaller music city doing it independently level. And we're going to break it up into three steps. Pre-production, production, and post-production. And we're going to talk about what those mean. And I would say, let's start with the first step, pre-production. Pre-production is exactly what it sounds. It's before the production. What do you do before you hit the studio, before you start producing stuff? And it's usually songwriting. Yep. So songwriting can come in many different forms. Uh, but usually what you'll see is your team kind of gathers what they need. If there is no team, you gather what you need. Now, what I mean by that is this. Uh, a producer is somebody who actually produces a product. The product does not need to be written uh, or composed by the producer himself. Actually, he can or she can uh, find the right writers, the right composers, the right uh, vocalist, and actually make a tangible product from there. But in order to do that in the pre-production stage, you have to know, okay, what kind of sounds do I want? So you find music producers people who make beats or compose and uh, you try to find a vibe for the, for the records that you're trying to put out next. You try to look for like a writer or if you're writing the lyrics yourself, you know, you just start getting concepts going. You say, I want to make this album about a breakup like Taylor Swift um, or, or Keisha. She's the queen of breakup in my eyes. Um, That sounds weird, but you know, her music is really good for those who are heart torn. I think we all know this, but um, if you're trying to go for more of a danceable R&B vibe, you know, maybe we're looking to write lyrics similar to what Usher's got going on. Maybe we want to yeah. make it, you know, all of these concepts are being drawn up, you know, but you got to find the team. If you don't have one, you can try to go on apps like, uh, there's like Vamper where it's all about collaborators coming together. It's not about, Hey, I'll charge you for this and I'll charge you for that. Sometimes you can just post up like, Hey, I'm looking for writers who do hip hop, you know, who yeah. wants to collaborate. You know, that's pre-production. You're trying to get everybody involved and try to come up with some ideas. And I w- and, and in layman's term, as well as in the terms of a home studio in a smaller music scene, not the traditional route, I would say pre-production is, is the songwriting. And, and let's say if the end goal is you want an entire earth, wind, and fire type production with all the horns and strings and band parts written out, but you wrote the song like Taylor Swift on just guitar, um, that's normal. That's fine. And that's pre-production. You're writing the song. Usually, mm-hmm. people write the song before they produce. A lot of days now with hip hop, where you can buy beats, you kind of say production and pre-production kind of kind of mesh lines every once in a while now. Um, but traditionally, you write a song, you ideate, and at the very least, before you get into the production mode, before you get to the producer, is I know what kind of vibe I want. I wrote the song guitar, but I think that we can make this like. A Bruno Mars meets Earth, Wind, and Fire kind of uh, production. If you and I, I hear some reference songs, like that's a good way of pre-producing, like knowing what direction you want to take it and having all the prep work and the writing part, the ideation part done. 
Yeah. Then we move into production. Yep. Production at at the higher level, which mm-hmm. Lou, be, I didn't even preface this. Like Lou, you've seen a lot of like writing sessions and production sessions. You've been a part oh, of yeah. a lot of them, including oh, yeah. like even a few weeks ago, you were a part of a writing session, production session with like a pre-production session with uh, with some big names like uh, Ray J. Oh yeah, uh, Ray J. Uh, so we're working on Keisha's new album. We'd had we've had many people pull up to the studio from like Lucky Day, Ray J. Uh, Brandy came to visit and listen to some tracks. Uh, we've had uh, Nelly come through. We've had yeah. Rumor, uh, like tons and tons of people. And like, you know, you're seeing all these writers come through too. And it, realistically, it's not even because they're trying to have other people write the music or anything. It's that everybody has so many ideas to contribute that this is what pre-production is at the same time that it can, like you said, merge into the production realm because some of these pre-production takes of vocals end up on the final records. You know, that's where like for a lot of people at home, you know, on a smaller scale, sometimes when you're writing, the take is the take. Like you try to mimic that vibe later and it doesn't really happen again, you know. But uh, yeah, no, on these bigger platform artists, uh, you tend to see a lot of times they'll, you know, talk to writers and things like that and they'll they'll pre-produce like that. But once you get to the production stage, you're talking about, all right, cool, we're going to get the musicians to come out. We have an, an idea for the arrangement. Or we may be actually creating around the vocals at this point. We just know what kind of tempo we're looking for and what kind of style vibes we're looking for. But um, in the production stage, you see writers come through and kind of finalize or reword certain things to get the lyrics to sit better, to actually tell the story a little bit better. You see musicians come through and recut the guitar, the bass lines. Drummers are doing all new drums on it. Um, And we're getting the record pretty much prepped so recording is part of it exactly we're getting picking the sounds as part of it like if you need a different synth sounds or different players exactly traditionally speaking a producer's job is to kind of uh oversee the the creation of the end goal like uh the vibe like so has a vibe and a vision in place and oversees the execution of it exactly so so for example in a traditional sense quincy jones as a producer mm-hmm. like yeah he played some trumpet and whatnot but that's not what he's famous for what he's famous for is bringing in the writers for michael yep. bringing in the drummer guitar player the horn players for michael that's what he's famous for he didn't even play necessarily play on the record as far as i know um yeah. and uh because he was the producer. The producer oversees the vision, how it's supposed to sound. So he takes, the producer would take the idea, d- traditionally, right? But now again, in the modern world, the, the lines and boundaries and description, job description of a producer is changing. Mm-hmm. Then it was more of like maybe some composing, some songwriting and stuff and overseeing the project and at least organizing the people and picking, like whatever. Now the producer in the hip hop world is also the beat maker. And a beat maker is technically not a producer, but nowadays it's starting to become one. Like if you mm-hmm. made the beat, then you might be involved with the vocal record, vocalist recording, helping him write. Like depending on how much you're involved, um, but like sometimes the producer is is just making beats and is yeah. not just writing the songs or writing only the back, like the instrumental, but like might also just be like part of the pre-production, part of the production, part of the post-production is actually doing the recording himself sometimes. Mm -hmm. It might be you. If you're recording yourself, writing your songs yourself, recording yourself, you are doing the pre-production and the production part on your own by yourself, like, which is fine. But that's kind of how the modern world blends the lines because of accessibility to all this stuff. Yeah. No, and that's kind of the cool thing. That's where, like you said, it is blurring the lines because, for instance, you know, like I said, we've been working on these big projects lately and everything, but... um, like a lot of the beat makers aren't really there. The uh, like, for instance, we got to work with uh, Camper, who did uh, Br- uh, Brandy's latest album. Mm-hmm. I, I know he did Ray J's upcoming album, and he's got a few records with Keisha. We'll see if they make it or not. But um, you know, the the cool thing is like he's actually actively there, coming up with ideas. But he's one of those producers that know how to read the room uh, in the production stage because he did his part. Like like we were saying, traditionally speaking, a producer will bring in these different elements together. Keisha's producing her own album. She is actually bringing in the producers. She's bringing in the writers. She's bringing in the musicians. She's hand selecting them because she knows that it's going to work for the overall intended goal. She's kind of executive producing this. Oh, dude, she is doing a killer job at it, you know? Um, But with that said, Camper knew when he needed to step out of the way as a producer, you know, because sometimes in the production stage, um, when we do things ourselves or we sign our own artists, 
We give ourselves all the jobs, but we forget that sometimes we can actually take a step back and let other people do things because they may just be a little bit better than you at it. Yeah. You know, um, and that's where like the, the, the line between independent artists working on their own and label backed artists can sometimes, you know, be, yeah. they have that extra people, like they're paying money to release the song with confidence to get confidence. for There's a little more incentive to bring out the higher dollar, you know, writers and stuff. And I think, um, uh, the big thing that we want to point out with this section is in pre-production, there's typically no recording. It's usually done at home or with people or in a group or whatever. Um, in production stage, not only you're, that's where the recording is. So if someone asks you for tracking, which is another name of recording, that's yep. what we say tracking a lot. Um, if you're tracking, that's part of the production stage. If you're playing the drums as a studio musician, but they're recording you, that's part of the production stage. Um, if if uh, you get asked for by someone to just do the 808 pattern, here, just real quickly, can you just do the 808 pattern? And you throw in an 808 after everything is recorded. That's still part of the production phase. Yep. Um, what's not part of the production phase is mixing and mastering, and which is why we're going to go into the next section, which is post-production. Mm-hmm. What is post-production in music? And pre-production, production, and post-production is different in film audio, but I'm talking specifically for music audio. Yep. Post-production um, is mixing and mastering. And I have an entire episode, one of the first episodes I've ever released and one of the most played episodes on my podcast is the What is Mixing episode. But Lou, without having heard that episode, mm-hmm. um, as quickly and as short as you can, how do you explain mixing to a non-producer? So mixing is taking the actual recordings and uh, some people will say, oh, there was already a mix done to it at the studio or whatever. But if if you had to really look at it, a lot of times what mixing is taking the elements that were recorded, then finding a way to blend them in a way that actually not only gives you the detail that you're looking for, it's for everything to be heard and understandable throughout the entire song, but it's going to allow you to sonically compete with what's on radio. So it's kind of the idea of a mixing engineer receives all of the tracks, all of the session files that was recorded and produced, no songwriting. All the songwriting is done. All the drum samples and Vocals the drums and tuned. everything has been tuned and edited. You could say editing is part of the production stage and vocal tuning is part of the production stage it sometimes. should be. Should be. Um, and in the mixing stage, you take all that and basically it's someone that has a really good ear that's better at making it sound good. Uh, example, in the film world, um, in production would might be, like relatively speaking, Voice is, is the actual capturing of the image. And then mixing would be, let's say, um, the editing and color grading. You have all this footage, and yes, it's kind of put together. But then, you know, the next the the next level editor is going to put it together and have like different changes of the free and the, changes the colors a little bit of the video. That's you, what a mix engineer does in music and yeah. audio. Yeah, like in video, the best way I can describe it is uh, when they're doing the color grading and everything. Literally, you can have an outside shot that once you go to the indoor shot. It looks like two completely different color tones. It's about getting the elements to actually sound and look consistent. So in mixing and audio, it's just the same thing. We're just trying to make it sound consistent, like it blends well, like it all... The best way I can describe it is it makes a band sound like they recorded in the room together. Yeah. And you can spend a bajillion dollars on recording and have it be the one of the best recordings ever, but it might still sound bad if it's not mixed. A yep. good mixed is very, is very, very important. And that's why this show is called Mixing Music. And that's why I'm a mix engineer as my profession. And that's why people make such a big deal out of it. Like if you are posting stuff on Spotify or on SoundCloud or Bandcamp or whatever without mixing it or mastering it, then you will probably notice a huge dramatic drop off in quality. Um, that you may not be able to explain, but that's mixing, right? The last step is mastering. Now, let me talk about the origins of mastering and how the lines are being blurred now. The origin of mastering is that, and mixing, is that the band, let's let's talk about Motown, right? Motown, the the Funk Brothers, whatever, they come in, let's say the Supremes are in there, they're recording. That's usually the production, the pre-production is very well rehearsed. The production is in the studio as they're recording, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because they already made the sheet music and the sheet mu- the creation of the sheet music is production or like the chord progressions, right? That's the production. And uh, as they record, the mixer would actually mix it to tape or to vinyl directly. Mm-hmm. Like long ago it was vinyl directly, but now it's to tape directly, right? Yep. Or it was to tape directly. 
or your recording platform directly. You'd mix it. You'd blend the vocals on the spot, on the fly. Now it's a separate job because you can spend more time on it. You And yep. you don't have to bounce it down to just a two-track, although that's what you're going to do. Um, Still try to get it right yeah, on the Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then the mastering engineer's job was the one that it got to before it hit vinyl. So uh, they, if it went from, if it went straight to vinyl, there was often time, like some studios still do this. The mix engineer is mixing as the tracking engineer is kind of like getting the levels ready as well, mm -hmm. helping out with the stuff. And then the mastering engineer is in the same room or in a different room, but it's, they're getting that mix, like that live recording. Mm -hmm. They're getting it at the same time. And all he's doing is with a magnifying glass and is, and, changing all the EQ and the compression a little bit to make sure that the needle stays in. Because the reason yep. the whole idea of like bass being wide is not good is because if it, if bass was wide, the needle would pop out. They yep. couldn't handle it. So, which is why wide in your bases because it's 2020. Don't do mono bases. That's stupid. Um, but uh, uh, that's a side note. But uh, <laughs> Unless you're going to vinyl. Yeah, <laughs> unless it's going to vinyl. Um, but it was the guy that would prep the mix to go onto vinyl because putting it onto vinyl, vinyl was picky, tape is picky. You had to, that was its own thing, right? But now mastering engineer is kind of like that. Mastering engineer, they get the mixes from the mixing engineer and they do that last magic, right? We, some people say black magic or they don't know exactly what to do. But the big thing is one, putting up to industry standard volumes by limiting it in the compression. So mm -hmm. every song on an album is similar. And if you release an album, other albums would be at similar volumes, right? Um, so it would help put that volume up as well as kind of do the final last little tweaks in, in the, um, actually, I think this is where, uh, uh, in the, in the painting world, recording pre-production is kind of like thinking, imagining, I want to paint a woman with a red vase. And then production is the actual painting. Mixing is the blending of the paint mm -hmm. and getting that texture going. And it could be done there. But it's not quite done because the last thing is mastering, which is framing it. The production is done. The mixing is done. Everything is done. But it can't be put in a museum without a frame. And that's what I feel like mastering is. Sorry, I hit the microphone there. But that's what I feel like mastering is. So you're right on that. Now, the funny thing is that um, mastering, aside from it originally coming from like people trying to cut the vinyl and everything and making sure that the needle didn't skip, that was a huge fundamental part of it. But what a lot of people forget about mastering is that you can't just master 10 different songs at different parts of the year and then release it as an album because none of those songs are actually going to sound consistent. Like, have you ever listened to an album where you skip from one song to the next and it just sonically sounds different? And like it, not genre wise or songwriting, like just sonic generally, it's just yeah. darker, or brighter. Or yeah. One song or has a little more bass than the next. The one song, the kick hits a little bit harder than the other. One song is a little bit darker, or brighter, like DK said, but more than anything, it's uh, when you're mastering, you want to have consistency on an album. And that's where the art of mastering is kind of under, undervalued. Now, a good mastering engineer, like I master a lot. I have a lot of, you can see my reviews everywhere. Um, you can hire Lou on SoundBetter and his link to his SoundBetter for mastering is in the description of the podcast. Ding. But uh, what's funny is this. Um, I constantly get people sending me singles to master, which is not bad. You know, I ask them, okay, let me listen to the song. Let me get a vibe for it. Do you have any artists that you like to listen to and one question that i always like to ask if you could be put on a playlist if you could be playlisted anywhere which playlist would you want to see your track on and that's a big deal for me because i want to make sure that it's consistent with all the songs there because we're talking about a single song we're not talking about an album now if somebody sends me an album i just want to know what they think is missing because i know what i think but I want to know what their intentions are. I want to make sure that it's going in the direction that they want it to go to. But every song needs to sound consistent on it. I need to be able to skip from one song to the next, even if it's just taking my mouse and going in the middle of each song or going to the chorus of each song. We have consistent volume, consistent dynamics, uh, consistent textures. Um, when you start one song to the next, are they crossfaded on purpose? Uh, where one song is ending as another is starting. Um, not only that, but funny enough, what a lot of people forget too is um, in the CD days, 
he actually created what's called the DDP file. And it was the mm. mastering engineer's job to actually credit everybody. And put in the metadata on the file. So if that's, you've ever put in a metadata. CD, yeah. if you ever put a CD into the computer and it automatically autofills the artist's name and the song. That names. was the mastering engineer's job. Yep. You know, because all you would do as a mastering engineer, let's say five years ago when CDs were still a little more popular. Five years ago, it was our job to kind of add this metadata. So I always asked people when I was mastering an album for them or even a single, like, who wrote it, who this, who that, and blah, blah, blah. And I'd create the metadata, and bam, I would send them a DDP file along with the WAV files. But the DDP file is what you would upload to CD Baby, you would upload it to Which I don't Discord. even think that they ask for that anymore. They still do, okay. but it's extremely unpopular because most people don't really realize the significance of it. The DDP file is what makes sure that people are getting credited without you having to fill it out because all that metadata gets plugged into the information for you. Yeah. So anyway, that's a little bit of mastering, a little bit of mixing, a little bit of post-production, pre-production, and production. Um, I think this is something that gets confusing a lot. If you have any questions, you can. it's, it's actually best to... Uh, hit us up, DM us on Instagram. I actually answer questions every single day. Yeah, I have I'm a lot of people responding. hit me up. Yeah. And I have a lot of people that hit me up. It might take a day or two or it might take a little bit of time for me to respond, but I always respond to everybody that asks me any sort of question and gives me any sort of love about the podcast. Um, but hit us up. I'm at DK Mixes, at D-E-K-E-I Mixes, and it's in the description of the podcast. Lou is at Midside Sound. Um, we could go into more depth of the pre-production and the different stages, tracking, mixing, mastering, pre-production, songwriting, whatever. And we'll go into depth more in future episodes as we can get different guests on. Um, I know right now we're talking to some songwriters that we might will have as guests mm -hmm. on the shows, some production producers, uh, some post-production engineers, mixing engineers, uh, other people. And as we talk to them, I just wanted to make an episode about the baseline of what this stuff means because I know a lot of new listeners don't understand where all the lines are blurred and what the steps are. A lot of people hire me for a master, but what they really needed was a mix. I know you had that yeah. recently. A Somebody lot of people, hired me for a mix and all they needed was a master. Yeah. And um, for example, like when do you want to, like if you recorded at home and you still think that you need to hire a producer, like what does it mean to hire a producer? Like it means different things. How do you send out these files? Yeah. How do you send out these files? Which by the way, um, in the, in the link in the description, I have a free downloads link. In the free downloads, you can download a free prep guide. Nice. If you're looking to hire a mix engineer or go look to hire someone else and you need some help figuring out how to prep your sessions and whatnot, there's a free mix prep guide um, in the link below. Anyway, uh, that's kind of it for today. Hopefully that answers any sort of questions that you have. Um, on that note, my friends, happy mixing and stay saucy. One, two, three. <laughs>